Well, tonight, again, 1 Peter chapter 4, as we're going through our Precious Marriage series. Um, again, tonight, I kind of titled it uh, Serious and Watchful. Um, Peter continuing in some kind of uh, heavy portion of scripture um, with his readers that he was writing to. And again, not doing an in-depth study, but we're kind of just going through, we'll do a light little commentary and then maybe hone in on a few things that we would feel like might apply to us whether we're at uh, within marriages um, again this last week I was able to do two different weddings and I tell you I was um, they were a lot of fun and it was a lot of rejoicing uh, it was interesting the first couple seemed like the couple that got married on Thursday like they both seemed like they just won the jackpot I mean the lotto I mean they were both ecstatic they were so excited and uh, so I'm thinking now oh, this is a good sign you know that's how you want to be when you get married um, then the next couple at least right before the reception the groom is just like crying and I'm like oh my gosh what's going on <laughs> is this tears of joy or tears of what the heck am I doing and stuff but I actually they came to church on Sunday and I talked to them and they were both all giddy and stuff so I was like okay good we're it's a good thing but uh, you can keep both those young couples in in your prayers but again tonight first peter chapter 4 verse 1 therefore since christ suffered for us in the in the flesh arm yourself also with the same mind for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin and again as we uh as verse 18 from last week told us christ suffered once for sin the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. Jesus set that example, we're to follow in his footsteps. Again, there was the gospel message of what he did for us, and especially coming up on Easter this week, it's always good to be reminded of what he did uh, for us. But then it says, arm yourself. And this word arm is to equip with weapons. And again, the weapons are, uh, are not of the flesh, but of the spirit. And for us to be renewed within our minds, again, with Philippians 2, having the mind of Christ. It says, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And when we have, as we're going to look at a little bit later, when we have that mind of Christ, we're going to be a lot more like Jesus, and we are going to sin a lot less. Not that we are sinless. We're not sinless until we're in his presence. But we should be sinning a lot less if we do have the mind of Christ. Verse two goes on to say that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. And again, having the mind of Christ means that we're pleasing God rather than pleasing our flesh. And when we live our lives trying to please God, we usually don't have a problem with walking in God's will. Verse three, for we have spent enough, enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And again, before Jesus, I don't know about you, but this is where I lived my life. Doing all of these things, lewdness is to live without any moral restraint. That, you know, our country is heading there really, really quickly. Again, people just wanting to do that was right in their own eyes without any more restraint. But this is especially in the sexual area. And then lust, the strong desires for the things that are unhealthy, the drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties are all speaking of, um, um, are, are living our lives for the partying or the rioting or whatever that would look like and the things that go along with that. But I love this because that word drinking parties, it, it, it also has the meaning of the carousel. And again, I like that because it just reminds you when we used to do those things, or maybe you didn't when I used to do those things, it was like you went round and round and round and you never went anywhere. You know, it's just that carousel, uh, not getting anywhere. And again, the abominable idolatries is just, um, it, it, it's putting yourself up uh, and worshiping your image. And it's all about image uh, for that person. Uh, and again, Peter tells us that was the past prayerfully, those are not things that are part of our present. Verse 4, in regard to these things, they think it's strange that you do not run with them um, in the same flood of dissipation, seeking evil, speaking evil of you. Again, the Bible tells us that we are the fragrance of Christ 
among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, the aroma of death leading to death. To the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And when we choose to no longer uh, go the world's way of party hardy and anything goes, people who live that lifestyle are not going to be okay with us because we send them a message, and it's a message of death, uh, that, that the, what they're doing is not okay. Because of that, often they do speak evil of us. Verse 5, continuing, be, they will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And as we talked about last week, we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, be held accountable for our conduct and our actions. Again, something most people, I don't believe, think that that is even going to happen. Um, and, and they just don't want to be accountable to anyone. They want to live how they want to live without any consequences. You know, that, that's kind of, uh, that's, I always think about Pinocchio. He tells a lie, his nose grows. I think if we had those same kind of consequences that when we did something wrong and something would happen, I would hope and pray it would kind of help us a lot more to not do the wrong things. But again, there will be a day that comes that every knee will bow, every tongue will confess to the glory of God that Jesus Christ is Lord. For this reason, verse 6, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit. Now, again, Peter already told us that Jesus preached to the spirits there in, uh, in 319, which we looked at last week, and it was a preaching a message of judgment. And again, most people believe what he's talking about here is at that same time. If you remember from Luke, uh, Luke chapter 16, Jesus tells the story uh, of, of a rich man and a beggar named Lazarus. And they both died and they went, the, the, the rich man went to kind of Hades and uh, uh, this place, Shoal, where there was a gulf between. And on one side was those who, you know, did, did wrong things. And on the other side, those who were trying to do the right thing. And, and the rich man or the, the beggar man named Lazarus ended up over there and they called that Abraham's bosom. And it was a place that, you know, most people believe that between Jesus' death and resurrection, he went and preached. We looked at last week him preaching that message of judgment to those who would be on the judgment side. And tonight he's preaching a message of hope to those who are on the right side in Abraham's bosom. But again, all that changed when Jesus rose again from the dead. Hebrews tells us about those who died in faith. It says um, they had not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured by them, embraced and confessed. They were strangers and pilgrims on earth who anticipated the work of the Messiah for them. So this preaching is to those who were, uh, who were dead it is not the offer of a second chance, but the completion of their salvation to those who had been faithful to God under their first chance. So that's kind of what Peter is talking about. Again, some difficult portions of scripture. But verse 7, but the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. So the end of all things or the last days. And, and do we believe we're in the last days? I know for me, I do. I, I look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy and li listen to what he says there. But know this, 2 Timothy, he says, know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come. Listen how he describes the men. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a, forming, a form of godliness, but denying its power. And we see this is what's going on in the world in which we find ourselves living in. Uh, again, uh, Peter is telling us now's not the time to party hardy, you know, and, uh, and being all about being a lover of pleasure, but it's a time to be serious. Sober-minded is really the word there watching the things going on around us. Jesus said, you guys can discern the times of the sun, the, the signs of the time. You can look out and you can say, or the, the seasons, red sky at night, sailor's delight, red sky in the morning, sailor take warning. 
but you can, you can look out and say, okay, we can discern the weather, the seasons, things going on, but are you discerning the things that are going on within your own life or the world in which we're living in around us? And again, um, when I read this uh, list from Paul and the conduct and actions of what will be in the last days, we see that this is something that is going on. And we want to be lovers of God, not lovers of this thing. And yet we should reflect that also in our prayers, in our desire to see others follow Jesus. Verse 8 goes on to say, And above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. How thankful I am for this, that love covers a multitude of sins because I'm a sinner. And yet Jesus says, hey, hey listen, this will cover a multitude of sin. It's love. It's agape love. It's unconditional love for other people. And yet I love it because in our scenario, it starts with the person who's sitting next to us, laying down our lives for them. So let's let the ladies start. Okay. Okay. Um, just as Pat said, he had titled this Serious and Watchful. And so for me, I kind of went through the verses and I made myself a, what I said was a little B list to make the most of our time here while we're here on this earth, just for purposeful living. And in verse 1, when it says, um, Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. And I was thinking about that uh, with Easter this week, and it's a celebration of the resurrection and new life. But what came first was that awful suffering and ridicule and pain and death where Jesus paid the price for my sins and for yours. And so on that first verse, when it tells us, since Jesus suffered for us in the flesh, I titled that one, Be Prepared. Getting, you know, I was thinking right now they're talking about vaccines, you know, when you go to get a shot or any kind of medical procedure, I don't know about you, but I would prefer to be forewarned if it's going to hurt. I don't want to be surprised. I want you to tell me it's going to hurt and then I'll know. Then I can prepare a little, I can be ready. And yet I love because Jesus has forewarned us. In this world, you will have tribulation but be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. He's warned us in John 16, 33, there's gonna be problems in this world. We're gonna experience suffering. We're gonna experience dis disappointment and hard things. We should expect and be prepared to suffer, especially for his namesake. In the message, it read like this, since Jesus went through everything you're going through and more, learn to think like him. Think of your sufferings as a weaning from that old sinful habit of always expecting to get your own way. I really like that because sometimes the things that we go through, the very things that the Lord will use to purify us and to make us holy and to make us more like him. And so we're encouraged here to be like-minded with Jesus. In the Amplified, it said, with the same purpose, willing to suffer to for doing what is right and pleasing to God. And so the challenge for us as wives, as women, sometimes in this world, we are called to suffer because we need to do that because it's right and it's pleasing to the Lord. We need to do it because we're being like-minded with Jesus. We may get ridiculed, we might get left out, we might be overlooked because we love Jesus, but God is pleased and it helps us not to be so self-absorbed anyways. In marriage, sometimes as women, we've been trained and, and kind of groomed to have that fairy tale expectation that everything's gonna be happily ever after. Now, while this guy sitting next to you might be our Prince Charming, it's still good to have a prepared heart and mind. We are going to fail each other many times. We're going to disappoint each other. We're gonna let each other down. We're sinners, There's, that's just how it is. But when we have the same attitude as Jesus, we're not so taken back when, when maybe we've been hurt or insulted. We're not so easily offended when things occur. We're able to show grace and mercy when we've suffered hurt or insult. The mind of Christ will help protect my heart from being overly wounded. It doesn't mean it's gonna hurt, it's not gonna hurt, but sometimes we can allow that to be way out of control 
and the mind of Christ will help keep it all in perspective. It helps us to be quick to forgive when forgiveness is, is necessary, and it helps me to be less likely to keep track of other people's faults. You know, as women, we're really good record keepers, and yet that's not, we learned that in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, that love does not keep record of wrongdoing, and so the mind of Christ will help us. So we need to be prepared by imitating Jesus so that we won't be moved or overwhelmed when trials come. In verse 2, it said that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. How are we to live the rest of our time here on, our, our, on this earth? Well, for me, I put my second B was be gone flesh. I want my flesh to be gone. Verse 3 goes on to say, For we have spent enough of our time, our past lifetime, in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in all of the things that Pat pointed out, lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. We've wasted enough time, caused enough hurt, allowed enough guilt and shame to be in our lives, don't go back there anymore. It will only cause us more hurt and pain. In the message, it said this, you've already put in your time in that God-ignorant way of life. Now it's time to be done with it for good. And that's what Peter is exhorting us here. Be done with our flesh. Sadly, when things aren't perfect in our relationships, the enemy is right there to tell us lies. Remember the good old days? Remember when it was so great? It was so fun. You deserve to be happy. And he forgets, he just doesn't really forget, he neglects to remind us of the hurt and the pain and the consequences of living in sin. So don't go back there. Don't indulge in the flesh again. Choose to do the will of God instead to pursue what the Father has planned for you. Romans 6, 12, and 13 says this, Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. For you were dead, but now you have new life. Uh, one of the commentaries I read, Matthew Henry, he said this, The will of God is, to the good man, the strongest reason for any duty. And I, I just really love that because if the will of God, doing the will of God is number one in my heart, that's my number one purpose, that is the strongest reason for any duty, any reason to do the right thing. Colossians 3.17 says, And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to him, to God the Father. And again, for us as women, as wives, whatever we say, whatever we do in this relationship, we are still representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to act that way, be able to give thanks to, the, to our Father in heaven. When we're tempted, we need to tell our flesh, be gone. I choose to obey the Father's will. Now, don't expect the world or the people around you to rejoice when you put God first. And that kind of goes into verse 4 where it says, In regard to these, they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. And so my next B is to be separate. When we live according to God's will and not the will of our sinful flesh, people around us are going to notice we are different. We are separate from this world. They might slam us. They might gossip about us for it, but they definitely still see a difference. Even in our homes, don't allow my flesh to use the sinful methods of the past to fight problems or issues that arise. Yelling, screaming, temper tantrums, cursing, lying, unforgiveness, those are things of the past. I need to be separate from that. And I don't want to be running back to the world to make me happy when things are hard. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 and 18 says this, Come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. We know the end result of, of walking in sin. Some of us still are dealing with consequences that remind us of the pain of sin of the past. 
Remind yourselves often of the promise God makes here in 2 Corinthians. He will be a father to us. We get to be his sons and daughters forever. You know, we're going to um, be celebrating Good Friday this week. And it's not really a celebration when you think of it's a remembrance. We're thinking on all that Jesus had to go through for our sins. What sin actually did to him. And it will, when we are reminded of those things, it will help us to say no to sin. It will help us to say no to our flesh, to say no to the world and the temptations that are out there. Truly, sin is pleasurable for a season. There's no lie about that. When you're out partying, there's fun involved. But then comes the consequences. Then comes the judgment. And that's what verse 5 is all about. They will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. What love Jesus proved to us by submitting himself to the agony and the death of the cross. He had to pay the price. The judgment for our sins was death. And as believers, we are no longer condemned to death. Only because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are now promised forgiveness and new life. I don't want to have to stand and give account because Jesus has already paid the price. I want to be separate from the world. For this reason, in verse 6, it says, The gospel was preached also to those who are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. And that's my next B, is to be alive in the spirit. Instead of being dead in my sins and in my guilt and in my shame and in acting those ways, I want to be alive in the spirit. And you might say, well, how do we do that? Romans eight thirteen. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live... But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So that's what we need to do. We need to put to death the sins and the things of our flesh and walk in the Spirit instead. I love that it says in that verse 6, but live according to, but live according to God in the Spirit. What is in the Spirit or by the Spirit? That is only, these things are only possible through God's Spirit. If I want the fruit of the Spirit in my life, if I want love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control, I need to walk in the Spirit. I need to follow Jesus and allow His Spirit to guide my life, to guide my heart, to guide my words, to guide my attitudes. Galatians 5.16 says that if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of our flesh. If we live in the flesh, we're going to die eternally. But if we live in the spirit, we're going to live eternally. The choice is ours. And I want to choose to, live, to walk and live in the spirit. It goes on in verse 7 to say, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. As Pat pointed out, Jesus is coming again. He might even come in our lifetime. And so for this section, I wrote, Be ready. Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be ready. I want to live like I'm ready. I want to be looking for the return of Jesus, that blessed hope and that glorious appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ. I want to be like that in my marriage so that I'm not concerned and overwhelmed with the things of this life, the, the, the disappointments, the disagreements, the issues that we have, but remembering that, you know what, Jesus is coming again. All that stuff is passing away. I want to be looking to Jesus. In that verse, uh, to be serious and watchful, it means to be alert and sober-minded, to be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. The message says, stay wide awake in prayer. I like that. Stay wide awake in prayer. You know, just as pa Pastor Jeff talked about on Sunday, the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, I, you know, I think about that. I'm more often than not, I'm like the disciples. I sometimes sleep when I should be praying. I allow the stress and the fear and the confusion to overwhelm me. And sadly then, when the trials come, I'm caught off guard. I'm prone to lash out at others, especially my spouse. You know, you, just as... Uh, Pastor Jeff talked about with Peter, you kind of woke up and grabbed a sword and whacked off someone's ear. Sometimes as wives, as women, we can do that as well. When the issues come, if I'm not prepared in the Lord, if I'm not ready in the spirit, if I'm not walking in the spirit, my flesh rises up and I lop off ears and arms and all kinds of things because I overreact and I over respond. 
my, that's why my heart needs to be ready through prayer, focused on eternity. And I know for me, this was an area in particular that I was just really convicted because there's things in prayer I need to be more diligent in, pray more, complain less, you know, and um, that's just an area where I know the Lord was really convicting my heart. Verse 8 goes on to say, and above all things, have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. And for this section I wrote, be loving. Above all things, most important of all, above everything else, have fervent love. Love each other deeply. Continue to show deep love. Keep loving one another with God's unconditional agape love. That's a challenge because love one another in those hard times. Love one another in those disagreements. Love one another when maybe your spouse isn't really deserving of love or acting very loving to you. We need to have that kind of love, that fervent love that God has towards us. For love will cover a multitude of sins. Love makes up for practically anything. That's what the message says. Love makes up for practically anything. It overlooks unkindness and unselfishly seeks the best for others. That's the kind of love that God wants us to have as women as in his wives. One that can practically um, make up for anything, can overlook um, unkindnesses and seek the best for our spouse. It's not a sin cover-up, letting someone get away with something that's evil or wrong. It's a loving decision to not blab or broadcast or gossip about one another's failures. It's to be even willing to overlook maybe minor faults or hurts that happen in everyday marriage because they're going to happen. You know, it's our pride is kind of twisted when we try to make ourselves look better by tearing down our spouse, by pointing out their faults and their failures to everybody else. And that's, that's what Peter is exhorting us here. We ought not to be doing that. But God's way is the opposite and says, here's an awesome way to build up your marriage. By seeking the best for your guy who's sitting next to you, choose to be loving with God's love in order to encourage and bless him and not expose him to others when maybe he's done something wrong. Colossians 3, 12 through 14, I think we say this a lot in this <laughs> marriage ministry, but we're going to have it memorized, and that's good. Since God chose you to be the holy people he loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Make allowance for each other's faults and forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds us all together in perfect harmony. Amen. Amen. And guys, again, as I was, I kind of honed in on verse one where it says, uh, arm yourself. And I was thinking of kind of the army because that word is to equip with weapons. And I, I believe marriage is radically under attack. And I think we need to arm ourselves. Uh, we need to be equipped to handle the battle. And I loved it because Pastor Jeff yesterday, I told him, I said, man, you, you did a great intro for what I'm teaching on Monday night. Because he also quoted from 2 Corinthians 10 there where it says, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down the strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Again, men, your wife is not your enemy. We're supposed to be on the, the same team. Our, our, our warfare, warfare is not carnal means. Unfortunately, that is often where we fight. Remember James uh, 120, where it says, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Our carnal fighting gets us nowhere, and it never produces the righteousness of God. When we're mad, when we're angry, when we're frustrated, uh, you know, we, it gets us nowhere, and it never produces the righteousness of God. It, it doesn't. It produces carnality, and yet we don't war in the flesh. Uh, war in the spirit. Allow the Lord to pull down those strongholds of pride, self-centeredness. Cast aside those arguments and bring your thoughts into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Again, Jesus' words to us husbands, 
love your wives. Anything that we do doesn't look like loving your wife. We need to stop and consider this is not something that God would be okay with. We need to arm ourselves. And again, I like that because it's arm yourself with the mind of Christ. And what is the mind of Christ? Again, Philippians 2, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God did not consider it equal, robbery, to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation. I like that. That's where it starts with him. No reputation. Uh, if it's all about our reputation, all about us, we do not have the mind of Christ. Again, I don't know why I was saying this. I know guys who they have the, the trophy wife, the trophy house, the cars, the boats, all these other things. But oftentimes there's no joy, there's no peace, there's no happiness. But it's, it's, it's because it's all about them and their reputation and what they look like in front of other people. That's not the mind of Christ. But Jesus came and it says he took the form of a bondservant. He became a slave. And again, bondservant, this is the definition of a bondservant, the biblical definition. A bondservant is a person bound in servitude to another human being as an instrument of labor, one who has lost its liberty, has no rights, one who served his master to the disregard of his own interest, one who will is swallowed up in the will of the master, but has by his own choice chosen to be the servant. That was what Jesus did for us. Are we willing to do that for our wives? Again, I, <laughs> I was just thinking, see, oftentimes my wife will have a project. And then there's sometimes when I look and I say, okay, she's doing this project. I want to go help her do the project. So then after we're done with the project, we can kind of sit and relax and enjoy. But as I go and help her with the project, her mind thinks, hey, he's helping me with this project. I can start another project. <laughs> To which I think, wait, 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 that's not why I'm helping you. But if I'm truly the bond servant, it should just be, listen, I just want to help. And, and then that's what it is every day. How can I help? How can I be a blessing? But Jesus had also said that he humbled himself. And again, remember the scriptures. The Bible tells us God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And that we are to humble ourselves in the sight of God. And God is the one who wants to lift us up. Uh, to have the mind of Christ means we walk in humility. And again, it's just something I know. I don't know about you, men, but I know for me, that's difficult because I'm a prideful guy. I'm arrogant. I, I try to make the world about me and revolve around me. And, and yet to have that mind of Christ, it's like, no, Pat, it's not about you. It's about him. It's about God. It's about making him first. And then he says, now it's about making her. Hey, he humbled himself. And then in Bible, it goes on to say that he came obedient to the point of death. We talk about it every week. Husband, love your wife, Jesus Christ of the church, and gave himself for it. Jesus laid down his life for us. He commands us to lay down our lives for our wives. And again, dying to self. That is the mind of Christ. And, and yet he was willing to be obedient, even to the point of death, death upon the cross. Paul also said there in Galatians, God forbid that I should boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. That's the mind of Christ. Uh, it's remembering this world is not our home. We're pilgrims. We are just passing through. But he would say, arm yourself with that kind of mind. And again, if we arm ourselves and we think, I always go to Paul there in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, where Paul, if you remember, was chained to a Roman soldier. And as he's looking at this Roman soldier, he's looking at him and saying, you know, for us Christians, that Roman soldier has stuff that he uses for battle. We have stuff that we use for battle. His is made of the carnal things. Ours is of the spiritual. Because it goes on to say, he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Again, listen, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not, listen, when the, the tempers are going and the things are going on with your wife, stop and think. It's, listen, this isn't where the battle is supposed to be. And yet we oftentimes take it there and allow it to stay there. 
But it's not against flesh and blood. But he says it's against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this, this age, against spiritual hosts heaven, in, of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. He says, stand therefore, gird your waist with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness, your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and then praying always with all prayer, supplication in the spirit. Be watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. And again, have we armed ourselves do we have that armor on truth are we speaking truth to our wives righteousness are we trying to do what's right with our wives peace are we seeking peace are we pursuing that the shield of faith and again faith comes by hearing hearing the word of God but that shield of faith is what quenches all the fiery darts of the enemy listen in a spiritual way, sometimes when we will be going at things and stuff, sometimes I'll, I'll do this in, in, in the spirit, not, not physically in front of Mary, but I'm like, okay, I, I'm sensing that there are things going on and it's just a fiery dart and it wants to get me to respond and react in, in an unhealthy way. And yet, do we have that shield of faith? It is the protection from the enemy. Salvation. Do we have the helmet of sight? Do we know that we're saved? The sword of the spirit. Do you have your sword? Do you practice? And again, don't be like, I know a lot of guys who take the sword of the spirit and try to use it not for themselves to better themselves or use it in their own lives, but they want to use it against their wives and try to say, well, this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing when they're not following and walking in obedience themselves. I have found that I will spend the rest of my life here on this earth just trying to complete what God has asked me to do, let alone looking at Mary and trying to figure out what she needs to do. And yet for me, am I doing that? But then being watchful. Again, men, let's arm ourselves for the battle. Let's have that mind of Christ towards our wives. I remember getting a text a while back uh, from someone telling me that their marriage was over. I'm filing for a divorce. And, uh, and I'm thinking, whoa, that, that kind of came out of, you know, left field or whatever. And, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to be praying for you. Can we sit? Can we talk? And, and I could tell he just was not in, a, in, in the talking mood. But I know I went to prayer for him. And then pretty soon he texts me back a few days later and kind of says, you know, God really started busting me. As all I was doing was praying against my wife and you know she needs to change and she needs to be doing something and God started speaking to my heart saying I need to change I need to do something and he by softening his heart allowing God to work in him God began to do an incredible work within their marriage again guys let's have that mind of Christ have it towards our wives let's walk in humility um Let's love our wives. <laughs> I remember that's what the guy said. He said, you know what? God really, I really came to find out I really radically love my wife and I want to be with her. And I was like, okay, good. That's a good place to start because if that's where you start, then you're going to try to figure out how to, make, how to make that happen. And yet for us to put on the arm of God each and every day. I have a missionary friend and they pray this as a couple over each other almost every day. And it's something that would encourage if the Lord would lead you to do that. Just pray through that list there in Ephesians chapter 6. That we would be clothed with that armor of all of those things. And walking in those things each and every day. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you again, Lord, for your word and the things written here. I pray and ask. Lord, as we stop and we ponder and look around the world uh, again. Um, uh, we find ourselves, as, as Mary and I, as we walk almost every morning, we talk about these things. We find ourselves in a very unique place in world history, I think, and, and a very unique place even in the church, even in America, um, and the things that we see going on where there is so much 
of the, the people trying to um, just have their way, not be accountable, wanting to, to live however they want. And, and um, Lord, we, we know that these type of things, they grieve your heart, but yet for us, God, help us not to be caught up in that, but help us to have that fervent love one for another. Because if you've been speaking to my heart, this is really what it boils down to. It's not about whether I should or shouldn't wear a mask. It's not about whether I should or shouldn't get the vaccine or what. It's about, am I, do I have love for the brethren? Do I have love for my spouse? Is there love in my heart for others? And Lord, I want to walk in that love. And I want them to know that they're loved by a God. And Lord, for us, would we allow that to be a part of what is driving us even with our spouse? that our spouse would know that she, he is loved by you. So Lord, help us to have that mind, that mind of Christ that's willing to walk in humility and to love those around us. So we thank you and we do praise you in Jesus' name. And all God's people agree by saying, amen. amen.